said, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome wildlife ecologist, Dr. Karen Young, and Karen's speaking to us from Mornington Wildlife Secretary in the Kimberley. Thanks, Karen. Hi, Joey. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so, Karen, I, I mentioned briefly that Rowan's uh, otherwise indisposed at the moment. So, you're speaking to us from Mornington, but Rowan is up at Charnley River, um, which is the sanctuary north of there, uh, further in the northwestern part of the Kimberley. Why is he at Charnley and why can't he join us today? Yeah, well, uh, up here in the Kimberley at the moment, it's well and truly in the midst of wildfire season, uh, which means we're on wildfire watch um, and action in some cases. And that's what the case is today. There are a number of fires around, um, but one of those fires is up on Charnley River in the Artesian Range. Um, and so Rowan is up there at the moment with a bunch of other staff and, and that crew are doing what they can to look after an area of high ecological importance um, and also protect infrastructure. So mm. they're making lots of efforts out there at the moment. And so sadly, Rowan couldn't join us. Yeah, so um, just to, to show people what the situation looks like up there at the moment, and um, I guess it's important to remember too that fire does happen in the Kimberley at this time of year, um, and that's always been the way, um, but the timing and pattern of fire is what we try and um, have some impact on through our prescribed burning and through fire suppression. But at this time of the year, everything's quite dry, obviously, because it hasn't rained for a long time. Um, and so the fire that they're focused on, if you can see the centre of this map just near Sinnet Range, uh, that's Charnley River Station, Charnley River Wildlife Sanctuary, um, and the Artesian Range section in that northwestern part, uh, just south of the Charnley River. Um, so this is a, a satellite map called NAFI, which uh, really helps our, our staff on the ground work out where the fires are burning and, and what they need to do to prevent their spread into ecologically sensitive areas. Um, so that's, that's why Rowan can't join us today, I'm afraid. Um, and we've actually got some updates. So this is an image that he shared uh, from Charmley River this morning. So this is hot off the press or hot out of the chopper. Um, Kaz, have you been involved in any of the firefighting this year or in previous years? Uh, in watching where the fires are spreading uh, or pop popping up this year and providing information to help the team decide which fires we can tackle, uh, which fires we should go to, how we should go about that, um, which feeds in a lot of information about the ecological priorities of the area a fire might be in, also the terrain and whether something is possible to do there, the scars that are available to use as containment lines, um, and where we work with our partners, whether there are cultural sites uh, of importance and also carbon projects. So all of those factors have to go together into the decision making of which fires we can actually go and try and do something about and of course safety um, mm. is a big part of those decisions um, so that's mostly what I've been involved in so far this year um, but yeah in previous years I've been out there with the leaf blowers um, and the drip torches taking mm. action. Yeah it's um, it's certainly exciting work but very important too to limit um, these destructive fires that happen at this time of year and, and control their spread. So all right we might get back to back to basics again Kaz. So I know that you know the area we manage now, uh, either alone as AWC or with partners through various partnership groups, is enormous. Can you describe for uh, listeners who haven't been there what the landscape is like? Because it's um, it's a striking and and famous landscape for Kimberley. Yeah, um, it's quite a diverse landscape. So there are vast tropical savannas. Um, and although they have been subjected to changes in fire regimes and grazing by cattle in the pastoral industry, relative to other tropical savannas in the world, the ones here in the Kimberley are relatively intact. There hasn't been widespread clearing. Um, so we've got these sort of volcanic valleys and savannas, um, large mesas and rocky ranges, heavily dissected sandstone areas, rainforest pockets, um, large untamed rivers, um, so quite a diversity of habitats up here in Kimberley. Hmm. And I guess there's the, the big ranges which run through uh, where Mornington is and the Fitzroy River, and they really dominate the landscape in that southern sort of central part of the Kimberley. Um, 
Now, they, they were formerly known as the King Leopold Rangers, but they've recently been renamed with um, a local Indigenous name, which is which is fantastic. Um, in terms of logistics, you're, you're based at Mornington, and that's where we've got our research station. Um, but we've actually got projects all over the place. So how do you get around? Like, logistically, it's, it's such a big operation. Yeah, you're right. It, it is a huge operation. There's a lot of, a lot of land that we're involved in, in working on. Uh, so there's quite a lot of driving, that's for sure. Um, the nearest town could be Derby, which is about five hours away from Mornington on dirt roads. Um, Broome is about seven hours and, and that's in good conditions in the dry season. Um, so there is a lot of driving and quite often it involves driving to another homestead or a staging point where you can rendezvous with a helicopter and then using the helicopter to get into these much more inaccessible areas. Mm. Yeah, so vast distances. Um, and on the map just then, I, I had a number of the partnership projects, which we might come to a little later. Um, so a lot of your work has been in the, the Willigan partnership, which we'll, we'll go into some detail about. But um, Mornington is the longest established sanctuary of AWCs in Kimberley, and it's where we have our, um, our research station there. So it's really uh, a bit of a hub for all of AWC's activity. Kaz, I'm interested to hear why the Kimberley is so significant for conservation, because it's an area where we've focused a lot of our efforts. Uh, why is it so important? Yeah, so the Kimberley is quite special. Um, as I said before, the tropical savannas are relatively intact compared to elsewhere in the world. Um, but they have still been subject to threats like the rest of Northern Australia has. So we have seen declines in small to medium sized native mammals. So that's something we're, we're working towards in reversing those trends. Um, but also as far as all the records go, the information we have, and as, as, as far as we can say with the available evidence, the Kimberley hasn't seemed to experience any full extinctions of mammal species. Uh, so in terms of the Australian extinction landscape, that makes the Kimberley really, really special. And so that's something that up here we, we work to prevent as well. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's unique, isn't it? It's one of the only areas of Australia that hasn't lost any species. So basically the full list of, of animals that were there seem to still be there, although the numbers, as you say, might have reduced. Um, and so what are some of the animals that you're working with that are unique to the Kimberley or, or things that have disappeared elsewhere? Yeah, so there's a number of species that used to occur far more widely across Australia or Northern Australia, and their ranges have contracted um, and they're now only found in certain areas. Um, so the golden bandicoot is one of those, used to be found far more widely. It's now only found in the, uh, the northwest portions of the Kimberley. Um, the northern quoll has declined in, in various areas across Northern Australia. Um, but they still have some strongholds in the Kimberley it's, and they still occur in the rest of Northern Australia as well. Um, and there's a lot of endemic species up here in the Kimberley. So species that don't occur anywhere else. Um, so we've got things like Monjons, which is the world's smallest little rock wallaby. And yeah, there's just incredible diversity that you won't see anywhere else or that is holding on here in the Kimberley. Mm. Yeah, and I guess that's, you know, part of the reason for our focus has been there's a bunch of stuff that's unique, but there's also things where it's the last refuge, the Kimberley's the last chance to conserve them. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about some of the other species that you've detected this year. Um, as a wildlife ecologist, you oversee a lot of the biodiversity surveys or some of the biodiversity programs um, in the partnership projects um, and AWC sanctuaries. What is the the day to day work of those wildlife surveys? What does you know? What's the objective, and how do you set about to to survey wildlife? Yeah, well, there's there's a few different approaches and, and things going on at the moment. So, if we talk about the properties or the sanctuaries that AWC manages on their own, um, we do have standard surveys set up. So there are standard trapping surveys where we'll go out to repeat sites every year and monitor those small to medium sized native mammals as well as daytime and, and nighttime reptiles um, so that we can keep tabs on their abundance and the species richness in those sites which fall into different habitat types. So we can look at what's happening in those different habitat types and also 
stocked and destocked sites, so destocked from cattle. Um, there's also bird surveys and feral predator surveys, feral herbivore surveys. Um, but then when we move more into the partnership work with some of the Aboriginal corporations that we're partnered with, the, the first stage there is to start building up an inventory. So we'll go out and do inventory surveys to get a handle on what species are across that country and where they are across that country. And as we start building up that picture of what's where and how widespread or limited some of those species might be, we can then start having conversations with our partners and the traditional owners about moving forward and designing ongoing monitoring projects for species that are of importance to everybody. Yeah, it's it's exciting work. And I think that, um, you know, you're talking about the inventory surveys on partnership projects, which are underway at the moment. That must be really exciting because you're going to areas which in some cases haven't had thorough biodiversity surveys or at least not in recent times. So, you know, it, it really is, it must be a real sense of discovery when you're documenting what's there and, you know, you never really know what's going to turn up in the trap. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, I mean, when you select your sites, you, you have an idea of what you might expect to find in those sites. So, so then it is really interesting to see if you do get them or if you don't um, and why that might be. And yeah, there, there can always be some surprises. Um, so one of the trips that I was on recently, we put uh, traps out, so live trapping, and we weren't getting anything in the traps until the last morning and we got one Kimberley rock rat. Um, but we also put cameras out in that same site for after we left and everything that we would expect to be in that area was actually there. They just, I guess, were a bit trap shy and weren't going in the traps. So the cameras showed that, that they were all there through the inventory surveys, um, not just on the partnership areas, but on, on all the area we work on. We have had some pretty exciting discoveries. Yeah, so that we might talk about that and some of the things that have turned up this year. Um, so as we've said, you've been doing surveys on uh, Willigan country and I'll, I'll just bring the map up again. Do you want to talk about, um, there's kind of, it's quite a complicated uh, layout. So there are different blocks uh, that constitute the partnership area where we're working with uh, Willigan and the Wungoda Ranges. Um, so where have you been doing surveys this year? Uh, yeah, so there's there's lots of different blocks on that Willigan country and different traditional owners speak for different parts or patches of that country. Uh, so we've gone and done some surveys on Pantagen block and on Mitchell block. Um, and we've got some other surveys coming up as well. Right, so that's the uh, kind of Western blocks, is that right? Uh, more of the Western areas so far, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, and so this was um, adjacent to Charlie River Artesian Range. Um, so we assumed it might have had things like monjons and golden backed tree rats, things like that. But there's another species which turned up, uh, which actually hadn't been recorded in this part of the Kimberley for a long time, which is uh, a type of rat. But bear with us, everyone, it's a very special type of rat. Uh, what's this one, Kaz? Yeah, so we did detect the black-footed tree rat, uh, which is the one that's just come up on the screen there. So in the Kimberley, uh, this detection is only the second location for this species uh, that's been found in the Kimberley within the last 30 years. So they've been pretty hard to find, um, but yeah, we, we did detect them on Willigan country, which is fantastic. And I guess another example of how, how much these camera traps are helping us with surveys, you mentioned that uh, with live trapping, you might catch a couple of animals, but with a camera trap, you see everything that walks past or is attracted to the bait. Is that how you detected these rare species? Yeah, we got the black footed tree rats on cameras that were out in remote areas. Uh, and those cameras were out, usually we leave them out for about a month. Um, but in this case, they were out for, for two months because um, it was over the wet. But the detection was in the first month. Very, very cool. That's that's so exciting to you know be going through the images and turn up something that hasn't been recorded very much in the Kimberley. Uh, really, really exciting. Now there was another mammal which turned up in uh, part of the Willigan surveys. Um, something tree dwelling. What was this one? Uh, there was the Kimberley brush-tailed fascigale, which is just popped up on the screen. 
Um, so in, in the northwest portion of the Kimberley, there's an accepted distribution for where they are or where they should be, where you'd expect them to be. Uh, and in recent years, so within the last five years or so, we've had detections on Yampi Sound training area, which is more to the west. And there's also been detections much further north. Um, but we got these Kimberley brushtail fasciales in two locations on one of our surveys on Willigan. So this kind of helps to fill in the gaps in that distribution with, with recent records. Mm, that's fantastic. Any other threatened species turned up this year or, or rare discoveries? Uh, yeah, we've had, a, we've had a few surprises. So there were some cameras set up in the Artesian range, which were actually set up for Northern Quoll research. And uh, when some of the staff on team here were going through those camera images, uh, there was a little bird that popped up. Um, and one of the staff thought it looked like an eyebrowed thrush, which is something you don't really see on the Australian mainland. Um, so the photos were gathered and, and the evidence was gathered and sent off to the BirdLife Australia Rarities Committee. Um, and they looked at the evidence uh, and discussed it and voted and have accepted it as a record of the eyebrow thrush, right. which is uh, really interesting because they're migrants and they breed up in the Palearctic and then come down to over the winter in the Philippines and Indonesia. Um, but you don't tend to see them on the Australian mainland. There's, there's just a handful of records. Wow, fantastic. Of that happening. Um, so now we've had one on the Artesian Range. That's so cool. Um, and there's another, another detection this year which is a little bit surprising. Um, and I think we'll have to give a bit of context for people. So I, I think a lot of people watching will be in, uh, you know, the Eastern States in maybe Sydney, Melbourne or, or Brisbane, or even Perth. And in those places, there are brush tail possums, which are quite common. Um, and in some cases, people are not happy about having them in their roofs. But in the Kimberley, this is a rare species, isn't it? The brush tail possum. And there's actually a unique subspecies in Northern Australia. So uh, that was a, a surprise, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I know a lot of people aren't too keen on possums or brush tail possums. Um, but up here in the Kimberley, the northern brush tail possum is actually quite few and far between. You don't tend to detect them that often. Uh, but we have had in recent times quite a few detections. Um, so we have had records on Charnley. Uh, this year we had one on Mornington and also in two of the surveys on Willigan Country we had detections of northern brush tail possums as well. So mm -hmm. we're starting to, to fill in the gaps of the occurrence and, and where these, these animals are that you don't often see. Fantastic. Kaz, I'm really interested to hear more about uh, the Willigan partnership and you, you're a, a key part of, um, of AWC's relationship with Willigan in the Kimberley. Um, not just through implementing the surveys, but through uh, planning, talking about our various uh, land management programs as well uh, with the rest of the team up there. Um, I'm interested to hear how you collaborate and, and carry out surveys with rangers and traditional owners on Willigan country. Um, so what has that, that experience been like for you? Yeah, it's been a, a really good and valuable experience actually. Um, of course, because it's a partnership, there's lots of collaboration. So they have their goals and aspirations for their land through their healthy country plan. Um, and as an organization, of course, AWC has goals and aspirations for, for conservation. And there's actually quite a lot of overlap um, between those and between the partners. And so there's discussion with the corporation staff, Willigan staff and traditional owners about what we want to do or where we might want to go and survey um, and getting the traditional owners um, to come with us um, and knowledge exchange and, and share all of that. Uh, and it's been a great experience so far. Um, I've been out in the field with four different traditional owners and it's been really great to be out there with their assistance and have their help um, and see them strapping up cameras on trees and putting up flagging tape and writing data down using the GPS and you know, helping choose spots to put individual cameras. Um, and, and then the other things are, you know, I've, I've actually gone or undergone quite a few smokings. Um, so while we've been out there on inventory survey, we've come across a number of cultural sites um, 
and so they've done the, the necessary smoking of us. Um, and yeah, hearing their stories about the country, their personal stories or about the shape of landforms and what they mean has been really interesting. And uh, one of the TOs that I was on a trip with was super great at spotting snakes, which was awesome. Helped us add a few more species on the list. Good fun. Um, are you a bit of a reptile lover, Kaz? Oh, look, I love it all. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, um, yeah, you're in a lucky job where you get to work with all different groups of animals and in such a special part of the country too. Um, yeah, that, that Willigan partnership is so important to us. And I think it's, uh, it's great that there are benefits, obviously, for conservation um, and also for the Indigenous groups that are involved. Um, and it builds on our, our work with Dumbi Manyari Aboriginal Corporation, uh, which is a neighbouring area um, of the, the northwestern Kimberley. Um, so these partnerships are really important to our work. Um, and I think it's, yeah, we're already starting to see the results with, you know, detections of some of these rare and unexpected species in, in parts of the Kimberley. That's great. Um, Kaz, I'm also interested in just what life is like up there. You're living in a, a very remote part of the world. I think you mentioned it's quite a long drive. It's, you know, it's about eight hours drive in from Broome. Um, how do you prepare for the wet season, knowing that you might be cut off for months at a time? Yeah, um, so of course we're in the build up at the moment, so the wet is coming. Um, we've just recently had our last delivery truck into Mornington, which brings in food and supplies and equipment and other, other deliveries. So no more trucks now, that's all done. So we've done a bit of a buy up of dry goods uh, and, and stores for the wet. And I think on some people's orders, they missed out on a few things because we we're all trying to buy the same stuff and the, the supermarket ran out. Um, but yeah, we've got our dry stores in place and uh, we'll get fresh food in when we can. Um, and that depends on the kind of wet season that it ends up being. So some wet seasons are not so much of a problem. You can use the roads. Um, a big wet roads will get too soggy. So you don't want to be on them too often. Um, but if needs be in those really big wets, we can also get some food in on, on planes, big mm -hmm. mail plane. Yeah, it's, um, it's an exciting place to be. And, you know, at this time of year, it, it's very dramatic too, because it can go from firefighting to floods and being completely cut off in a matter of a week or two. So um, at the moment, I'm sure some of the team up at Charmley are praying for rain to help with that, the firefighting effort up there. Oh, yeah, we're all praying for rain. Yeah, lots of it, right? The activities obviously change during the wet season. So are you doing any surveys that are particular to that season for, you know, frogs or things that come out more in the rain? Uh, or are you doing more office work when you're stuck? Uh, a bit of both, a bit of both. Um, so the wet season usually has been a, a chance to get some office work and reporting and things done. Um, but of course, yeah, when the rains come and you've got frogs and, and other species. Um, so there are plans on, on some areas to use audio recording devices um, and, and trial that to detect uh, not frogs, but we can also use them for, for birds and, and bats and things. Um, I'll have a trip coming up at the start of December, whether the rains have come yet or not, um, for a camera deployment that will go out over the wet season. So that'll be a wet season inventory. Um, so yeah, there, there is still field work that happens and there'll be a bunch of field work happening up uh, in the Artesian range in, in the wet as well. Exciting. Um, yeah, I guess when it's helicopter access, it doesn't matter if the roads are too foggy. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit of flying. Yeah, uh, we've had a question here from one of the listeners just asking about cane toads and uh, whether they have reached their part of the Kimberley that we're working in yet. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so yeah, cane toads have been coming across Northern Australia for quite a while now, um, haven't been able to be stopped. So in some parts of the Kimberley that we work on, they are here. So they arrived at Mornington in the wet season of 2016. So they've been here a while now. Um, they've been coming across Charnley and they have now reached the Artesian range. Um, so about everything 
kind of west, it, it's not a straight up and down uh, front. It, it is on a bit of a diagonal, um, but pretty much west of Chanley, uh, they're not there yet. Um, but with each with each wet season, they get further and further. Mm. Now, the, the impact of cane toads, and some people will be familiar with this, is that they're toxic as eggs and tadpoles and frogs. Um, so there's a couple of different threats that they pose. One is just through competition with native frogs, um, but kind of more insidious is the fact that anything that eats frogs or eats something of that size uh, can also be affected by the toxins that toads produce. Um, and so some of the species that have been really badly affected are things like the northern quoll, um, small marsupial predators. Um, and we've seen their populations impacted as toads have moved across northern Australia. But there are some places in North Queensland where toads have been for decades and northern quolls are able to coexist. So there's work being done on how that interaction takes place effectively with especially with that invasion front, it seems like those first toads to arrive have an especially big impact. Um, and part of it involves actually teaching quolls not to eat the toads. So that's that's one approach. Some of that work has been done at Mornington Cas, is that right? Yeah, so uh, previously there was a, a PhD student um, who was based out here and, and co-supervised by AWC. Um, and doing a lot of research work on this idea of conditioned taste aversion. So basically feeding uh, the quolls baits of, of toad meat that had a small amount of a chemical in it that would induce nausea. Um, and then that nausea and, and sick feeling uh, theoretically should teach them not to, to eat something that smells like a toad. Uh, and a lot of that research has occurred uh, throughout Northern Australia. And there has been some promising results in that, showing that under certain conditions, quolls can learn to avoid to eat toads, but there's lots of factors that go into it and whether that's actually gonna work uh, in situ in a landscape scale in the wild. Um, so this thing's like, well, have, how many quolls in a population actually take the bait? Um, and if they took the bait, did they fully consume it? Um, did they get a dose that was enough to cause sickness? Did they learn from the sickness if they got sick? Um, how long does that lesson last? Um, how densely do you have to apply the baits to maximise the number of quolls in a population that take the bait? Um, and so there's lots of things that need to really be worked out mm -hmm. for, for whether it's going to be efficient or not. And some of our more recent work um, in the artesian range has shown that the quolls there weren't actually interested in eating the baits, which mm. makes it really hard for any lesson to be learnt. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think you, you can get some different results in different populations um, with quolls, but as you said, we know that in some places where the toads have been for a while now, um, if enough of that quoll or, or other native animal population uh, lasts past the invasion front, then there is a chance to rebuild. Mm. There's, it's a, such a complex and interesting story, um, but I think, you know, basically at this point we can say work is ongoing, um, but we know that cane toads haven't caused any extinctions to date across Northern Australia, whereas some of the big uh, systemic threats have caused massive declines. So things like feral herbivores, poor fire regimes, we've seen the declines that they've driven, especially in small mammal populations. And they're the things that we're trying to alleviate in the Kimberley through our different land management programs. Um, and look, that's, that's really a whole other story. So we might have to have a, another webinar from the Kimberley, I think, because there's a lot to talk about there. Um, we've got another question here about a beautiful bird, which many of you will know, the Gouldian finch. And um, is it a great photo taken by Liz up at Mornington? Um, so this is a seed-eating bird, and I believe, Kaz, you've just had the, the surveys for seed-eating birds in the Kimberley. Uh, what's the goal of, of those surveys, and why is it important to look at that group in particular? Yeah, so the Gordian finch uh, is a seed-eater, but they can be impacted by fire regimes. So they tend to be more nomadic during the dry season and feeding on sorghum seeds. And then as we move into the build-up, that food source is more exhausted. 
are not so available and they switch to eating seeds of, of other plants and some of those are spin effects. Um, but a number of the spin effects have to be three years old or more in order to set seed. Um, so in this build up period as they're coming into the wet and coming into breeding where they're actually tied more to a spot where they've got their breeding hollow and so can't fly as far. Um, if they don't have those, those food sources, um, then they do struggle more. Uh, so yeah, having the correct or, or useful fire regimes is, is important for the Gouldians. And um, yeah, we usually do a, a big finch survey uh, at the end of the dry in September. Uh, this year for Mornington and with COVID, because uh, we rely a lot on volunteers um, and, and good bird, birdo volunteers. Um, so the Mornington one wasn't able to go ahead this year, but we have done a waterhole survey up at Charnley, which has involved both cameras and people observers. Um, so, so yeah, they're an important one to keep an eye on. Yeah, and that's um, it's a survey that's been running, I think, for probably over 15 years now. So a long running uh, finch and seed eating bird survey. Um, and I guess by looking at numbers over such a long period, even though they're nomadic, you can get some idea of how, how that guild of birds is doing over time, um, especially in response to our land management. So it's important work. Um, we've got a, a question here that's a little bit left field, um, but it's a topic that I'm really interested in. Uh, a question from Jemima who asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the long-beaked echidna specimen, uh, which was reported to have come from the Kimberley in the late 1900s? Um, now this, this was a specimen that is, it, it's a species basically that's limited to New Guinea today and there are no modern records of long-beaked echidnas from Australia. Um, and I think there's been a lot of work trying to trace the provenance of this specimen. So a skeleton that was supposedly collected uh, in the early 20th century just east of Derby. Um, I would love to believe that there are long beaked echidnas hiding out somewhere in the Kimberley, but I think subsequent, subsequent work has shown that might have been mislabeled. Um, anyway, that's a bit of a sidetrack. Kaz, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, look, yeah, I, I don't really know too much about that particular specimen of the long beaked echidna. Um, mm. What I know is that we do still have some of the short beaked ones running around the Kimberley. They can be hard to detect. Um, but we, we have actually detected them on camera on a number of our surveys this year. Mm. So those ones are out. Yeah, great. Um, there's also been lots of important work done in the Kimberley looking at uh, feral cats. So there was a, a long standing um, study by Hugh McGregor looking at how feral cats and fire interact. Um, and again, we won't be able to get into that in much detail, but Kaz, what was the important interaction that came out of that study? Um, what did we learn? Oh, there, there was a lot that went into that and that came out of it. Um, but basically there is a huge interaction between feral cats, feral herbivores, so cattle and fire regimes. Um, and so basically if you have a combination of a bad fire regime where it's widespread and intense, and then you've also got cattle that graze out regrowth, you have the maintenance of large bare open areas and large bare open areas are where cats can hunt much more successfully. Um, so if you reduce that habitat complexity, the feral cats do much better at hunting and of course the native animals do more poorly. Yeah, yeah, so a really important study and, and that has had implications for projects across Australia, not just AWC, but um, it really furthered our understanding of how feral cats interact with other um, land management, but especially fire, grazing, um, you know, those other impacts as well. So really critical research, which has been carried on at Mornington. Um, it really is a special place up there in the Kimberley. And I just wanted to share another landscape photo from uh, the area that you've been working in on Willigan country. Absolutely spectacular. Um, what's it like working up there at the moment? Is it very humid? What are the conditions like? Uh, yeah, it's it's quite hot at the moment up here in the Kimberley um, and getting quite humid as well. Uh, last night wasn't too bad, but the night before it was still 42 degrees when I was trying to go to sleep. And I think it was still about 38 degrees at two o'clock in the morning. Um, so that, that can make it difficult for sleeping, but also it doesn't help the fire situation either. Um, so yeah, quite quite hot here at the moment. Looking forward to the rains coming properly. Yeah, 
Well, it's um, it's cold and rainy in Sydney today. I've got my fleece on. Kaz, it's been a great conversation and thank you for, um, for telling us all about that important work in the Kimberley, especially those rare sightings and, and detections of threatened species this year. And good luck with all of your work on the Willigan project, because that's a, a really exciting partnership project for us. Yeah, thanks, Joey. It's been good to have a chat. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the new edition of Australian Geographic magazine has just come out today and it includes a major feature about AWC's conservation work in the Kimberley, um, featuring my colleague Jamie Dunlop and, and the whole team at Mornington uh, and the Kimberley talking about their work up there. So if you can find a copy of Australian Geographic, it's the new one with an echidna on the front, um, you can read more about uh, AWC's work in the Kimberley. I'll also just show you again the Wildlife Matters magazine. Uh, which is now available on our website, australianwildlife.org. At our website, you can also make a donation. And we've recently launched our Christmas giving campaign. We'll email soon with more information about that. But if you go to the donate page, you'll see that you can give to a range of different projects. And you can choose to give a gift to someone. So make a donation on their behalf as a, a Christmas gift. And you can also send them an e-card, which is personalised. I'll just show you what the website looks like. But again, this is at australianwildlife.org and you can choose which of these projects you'd like to support. Um, so it's a, a gift like no other, you know, you're helping secure the future for Australia's wildlife. Um, and I think that's something that people will definitely appreciate. So it's a good Christmas gift option this year. Thank you everyone for your support. Thank you for tuning in um, and we'll see you next time.